Director Thornell, again, thank you for sitting down with us. I know it's been a minute. And I just want to start off because we've done a lot of reporting since we last talked. And one of the things that people have told me from the governor to nearly everyone that works in the prison space to Mr. Williams, who we just met downstairs, has said that you are the right guy for this job. Do you believe that you are? Absolutely. Why? I think I bring a, a perspective and uh, an amount of experience um, in corrections, but in modern corrections and maybe a little bit of a different approach to corrections that uh, I think everyone agrees is much needed here in Arizona. And I think that's what people have seen over the last year. And that's what people are going to continue to see from me. Um, and so I think, I think that's what makes me different, makes me unique, but makes me the right person for the job um, as I was last year as I am this year and as I will be going forward. You inherited a prison system here that had a lot of problems in it, still has some too. What's been the biggest challenge for you this past year and few months? Um, it's been no shortage of challenges. Um, you know, as you said, I, I inherited a system that has been built over decades and decades with some challenges that um, have withstood the test of time. Um, I knew that coming in. I think that the, the biggest challenge, the biggest growth factor for us is really building a foundation of what modern, what good corrections in the 21st century really looks like and providing the professional development and the training opportunities to our staff to help them um, as they take on this new approach. Um, you know, one thing that really uh, captured me in the first year was the buy-in from our staff to really want to do good corrections. Like they, the staff in our complexes and out in our field offices are really committed to the work um, and they really are committed to the population and doing what's right. Um, my real responsibility and really the challenge that we've rolled out over the last year plus is providing them the opportunities to learn what that means in 2023 and now 2024 and exposing them to new types of training new types of policy approaches, new communication strategies. Um, and I, so I say that as a challenge because, you know, we're a, a staff of 8,000, we're a large agency, and so there's just time challenges and implementation challenges associated with that. But I also consider it one of our greatest successes uh, because we've been able to make uh, headway in that. We've been able to offer those opportunities to staff. We're continuing that as we roll into year two, and we're gonna continue to emphasize that, and the staff have responded really well. And you said big agency, 8,000 people, but there's still space that needs to be filled. I know it's not just in the healthcare realm, but overall staffing is an issue for the department. How do you plan to fill those spaces and make sure everything's running smoothly? We plan to continue doing what we're doing. Um, we've actually uh, cut the vacancy level by 10% in our first year um, to where we have just over 1,000 vacancies today. Um, and so as we look across the progress we've made, we're happy with the direction we're trending with hiring of staff and maybe more importantly, the retention of existing staff. Um, you know, we had a trend going where people were coming in, working a very short period of time and leaving very quickly for other opportunities. And we've seen that slow down where people are staying longer and are, are demonstrating a higher level of commitment and retention. And so we plan to keep doing that. And a lot of it is advertising, obviously, and marketing and hiring processes but there's a significant piece of it that goes, uh, comes from word of mouth, from our staff speaking to people out in the community, but also the community being able to see the work that we're doing and the changes we're making and the progress that we've undertaken. Uh, so I think it's a combination of all that, and we're gonna continue that, because as I said, it's working for us right now, um, and we hope that it will continue to work for us. How does your experience here so far differ from your experience in Maine? Uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think the experience here in every way is different than, than the Northeast, just like it is probably from the Northwest, the Southeast. Every region of the country has different dynamics, um, whether it's geographical dynamics, uh, whether it's climate dynamics, uh, population changes, what have you. Um, and so it's really just been about um, me taking what I know, taking my experience, taking what I've seen work and not work, and adapting it um, for the, the dynamics of Arizona. Um, all of those different things I mentioned, you know, whether it's, again, geography, the design of our complexes, the size of our staff. Um, what I do know is that the staff, the population, the communities, um, and the, the factors that are at play 
largely are the same. Um, you just have to figure out what they need in a different dynamic, and that's what we're doing. Those are the strategies that we're employing. And you know, one of the differences we know is climate here, obviously, gets hot. Um, when we last sat down in July, we had asked about temperatures in Perryville specifically, but we've since come to learn that three prisons last summer, Perryville, Lewis, and Kingman, all had documented temperatures inside cells that were higher than 100 degrees. What is it like for you to hear that, see that in your own records? I mean, it's, it's unacceptable um, in terms of having a, a living environment that has a temperature that's that high. Um, I felt it myself, um, and it, it's not something that we should expose anybody to, whether it's an inmate population or anybody in the community. Um, you know, last summer the heat was obviously unprecedented. Um, we'll see what this summer has in store for us. Um, but, you know, I will say that the benefit of experiencing that is that we know what we need to do better. We know what we need to do differently. And I think everybody who saw the changes that were made last summer, uh, whether it was the population or staff or, or the community, knew that we were being responsive in those moments. Um, and those changes rolled out statewide. So I can't always control the exact temperature inside of a cell because I can't snap my fingers and have air conditioning in one of those cells instantaneously. But I can control what's a, what is available to people outside of those cells. I can control some of the air conditioning environments that we give them access to that we maybe didn't give them access to. And some of the other things, risks I'll call them, that I'm comfortable taking in order to provide a cooler environment or a mitigation strategy. What are some of those risks? What do you mean by risks? So things that, you know, I use that word from more of a risk management standpoint, not like a corrections risk standpoint, but things like putting misting systems out in a, in a corrections environment where you have a higher concentration of water um, exposed to some of our physical plant areas, right? There's risks that come with that from a physical plant standpoint. Um, you know, providing uh, a more of an open um, yard, as we call them, so that people can move freely from uh, a cell environment that might be warm or hot or extremely hot to an air conditioned environment and not have to wait at two, three, four locked gates to get there. And so we have those opportunities to change things that previously were very status quo, um, very controlled environments, very locked down sort of environments, I'm okay taking a risk by opening up those locked gates and giving somebody more free access to those environments because it means that he or she can go from their extremely hot cell at some times to an air conditioned environment and, and receive that cooling um, environment and participate in whatever we might offer there from programming, socialization events, what have you. So those are just a few of the examples. Were you surprised to see that some of the cell temperatures were in the triple digits? Um, I wasn't surprised in terms of, uh, you know, that compared to the outdoor temperature, um, you know, because any environment that sustains 115, 120, 125 degrees from an outdoor environment, whether you have air conditioning or not, when you have a door facing the outside temperature, you're going to have a very hot cell. Um, I think what, what I was more surprised by were the number of cells that were impacted as extremely as they were. And so as we went from tier to tier, door to door, inside rooms, some of which we stayed in for long periods of time, um, I think that's what surprised me more was the extent of the heat, um, even in the areas that uh, weren't directly facing the sun and things like that. And is this, when you visited, you're saying Perryville, or were there other facilities that you visited regarding heat? Um, Perryville specifically, I went to multiple times, but I also, you know, just regularly go to, to facilities, and I don't stop doing that in the summertime in the heat. Um, and so we know that we have um, our Iman complex that has areas that get warm and have evaporative cooling. We have places that um, our Lewis complex and different part, uh, locations across the state that are impacted by the heat. Um, now, I think Perryville had some of the highest temperatures for a sustained period of time, um, but it, it impacts lar largely our facilities in central Arizona. Our reporting found that the heat impacted not just the people incarcerated in the prisons, but staff members too. Are people safe if they're working, living, staying at the prisons? 
I think they're safe, absolutely. Um, you know, I think we demonstrated that last summer. Um, you know, luckily and thankfully and through our strategies, we were able to provide people access to cooling environments that kept them safe, kept them healthy, um, kept them accessing what they needed to through those mitigation strategies. And I can confidently say as we go into this summer, um, we will have even more and we will have even better and uh, stronger strategies. Um, staff specifically, um, we provided a lot of mitigation strategies to as well, um, whether it be um, access to water, air conditioning environments, different approaches to what they do out on the yard, how we relieve them and give them access to break areas. Um, you know, it, it's obviously a very challenging environment and a challenging job for that when a lot of their time is spent outdoors. But uh, it's not just the population that we need to take care of and make sure they're safe, it's also the staff and, and that's part of our mitigation strategy. We found that, you know, both inmates and staff had to be at times hospitalized. We found that staff were sent home on some occasions. Is mitigation really working if those are the outcomes? Absolutely, it's working. Um, you know, we did have uh, a few instances at one or two different complexes where staff reported some heat related symptoms um, and were absolutely sent off site for evaluation, which is the protocol, protocol I want followed. Um, and it's no different than if a staff member uh, is feeling ill because of some other dynamic. When that's reported, we want them sent off site, evaluated, and then either cleared to return to work or doing what they need to to become healthy and then return to work at a later time. Um, and so, you know, that's going to happen. That happens in any heat-related environment, um, anytime you're outdoors. I think our strategy is to mitigate those occurrences and to help make staff aware and the population aware of what they can do to access those cooling strategies and take care of themselves and to communicate that to them and continue to communicate that to them because we want them to be safe. But oftentimes we get really regimented in our jobs and in our daily activities um, that a good reminder to stop and drink some water, a good reminder to take a break and go cool off is what's necessary. And so those are some of the strategies that we employ and they absolutely pay off. Um, you know, in Arizona, in 120 degrees for 30, 40, 50 straight days, I think the few occurrences that we had shows that our mitigati mitigation strategies actually are working. Have you seen any of the temperature logs from the facilities last summer? Absolutely. We noticed when we were looking at them that there were a lot of, they were being taken differently. They were, you know, some were handwritten, some were not. None of them had the same format. What, you know, what does the makeup of those logs say to you? Do there need to be changes there? So we've already addressed those issues as we come into this heat season to where we have standardized forms as well as standardized training that's being completed as we speak across our correctional security staff ranks, but also with our maintenance staff because we have two different types of temperature checks we want completed in our complexes, in our individual cells and in, in room environments. One is the ambient room temperature so that when you walk in, we're recording the actual feel of that room. Right? And so that's what we're training our correctional officer staff to do. And the second is uh, recording of the temperature of the air coming out of our vents, whether it's an evaporative cooling vent or an air conditioning vent, our maintenance staff need to go in regularly and do go in and take a temperature of that air directly coming out of the vent. And then they record those under separate maintenance logs. And so that's what we're doing right now is we've identified the logs, standardized that process, and now we have training rolling out to those groups of people so that we can make sure everybody's operating the exact same way when they're taking temperatures, recording them, and reporting them. And something we noticed, and I know it sounds like there have been some changes already, but I do want to show you, and we did send this to the media department multiple times before reporting on it, but these are from Kingman, um, one of the units there. I know it's one of the privately operated prisons here, but it appeared to be a repeating pattern. And I didn't know if this was ever brought to your attention or if this stands out to you in any way or if this was ever investigated, that the same numbers were being recorded over and over again. This is the first I'm seeing these, uh, these documents specifically, so I haven't spent any time looking at them specifically, so I can't comment on anything that's abnormal. But it is the same temperature as it appears. As you were working to make changes, did you notice that there may have been some inconsistencies in how people were keeping records, were maybe were there ever any concerns that some of them could have been falsified 
or written incorrectly. I didn't have any concerns uh, last summer about falsified logs based upon what I saw firsthand um, when I was either at Perryville or at other complexes and just saw our staff doing that. So I, I still have no reason to believe from my own observations that you know our, our agency staff are falsifying anything. Um, I certainly know that there were inconsistencies in the forms used as I mentioned, um, but our focus now is going forward, right? Our focus is on making sure staff have the training, the consistency, the forms that they need, um, and the expectation is clear. And I'm very confident in that process as we head into 2024's heat season. Did our reporting shed light on anything you didn't know? Um, well, I think when you bring forward uh, consistencies like this in these numbers, I think this is absolutely helpful to have you bring this forward. Um, you know, and I think your reporting um, exposed a, a voice for people that were um, maybe still are inside Perryville and some of their concerned family members. And so I always welcome that sort of communication. Uh, but we certainly knew that the temperatures uh, were high at Perryville as are other complexes. Um, and so it didn't, it didn't put that on our radar for the first time, but it certainly helped communicate things to us. I do want to shift gears a little bit to Jensen v. Thornell, and I know it's an active case, so I appreciate you know, that there may be things you can't speak about, but you know, what's been the biggest obstacle in dealing with this lawsuit? Um, you know, I think I would, I would highlight a couple of different obstacles, if I could, because uh, I think, um, you know, obviously staffing, you heard, you, you mentioned earlier, you were in court um, on Friday, uh, and so you heard the significant conversation around staffing. Um, and I think that's going to continue to be the focus of um, the, the court and our court monitors. Um, specifically staffing levels related to healthcare, uh, medical and mental health. And so that's, that's a significant challenge um, and it's gonna remain that way. I think the other complicating factor with staffing is the broader uh, healthcare staffing struggles across the state of Arizona, not just related to corrections, um, but we know that you know, as we look ahead over the next year or two that the number of healthcare staff that the state needs um, is going up significantly and we don't have the people to fill all of those needs and so when you put a correctional environment healthcare next to that it makes our challenges even more significant um, so I would say that's that's number one and number two is back to what we talked a little bit about earlier is um, you know on just the broader correctional aspects of the lawsuit um, we really are working hard to move the agency from some of the struggles that started 10, 11, 12 years ago and changing those and morphing those to today. And you know that's been a challenge, but I think we've also seen significant progress when you look at um, how the department used to utilize our maximum custody, our restrictive housing areas um, to where they are today. You know We've reduced that population by 85% in just the last year. Um, so that's been a challenge, but it's also been a great success um, over the last year. Um, so there's just a few of the things that we know um, continue to face us, but as you heard um, on Friday, staffing is going to be the biggest issue as we go forward. And if you know that's such a challenging issue, how do you get the numbers up to where you need them to be to be compliant with the court's order, but also just functioning correctly in the system? Well, if what you're doing right now isn't working, then the challenge is finding out something different, trying something different, and that's really what I continue to push and is going to be my push as we go forward is if our advertising isn't working, if the staff aren't being recruited in using the practices and even the wages that we might have been advertising, we need to do something different. And that might mean increasing wages. That might mean recruiting in a different way. That might mean partnering with others in the community for services differently than we have in the past. The reality is whether it's related to the lawsuit, related to corrections, what have you, if we need to do something different, if we're expecting a better result and what we've done in the past hasn't worked, we have to be willing to try something new. We have to be willing to get uncomfortable with trying something new and taking those risks, like I mentioned earlier. What about NAFCARE? Are they the right partnership right now for the department? Well, when I say we, I mean NAFCARE. They're, they're with us in this. They are our partner. Um, we have a contract with them. Um, and so obviously if I have a contract with them, um, I'm going to tell you that they are the right partner um, because they're still our partner and we're still working collaboratively to move that forward. Um, 
But again, as you heard on Friday, uh, they're being held accountable. They're being held accountable in a way that's different for contracted vendors in this agency of the past. And that causes discomfort. That causes some tension at time, times. But again, if we're going to get a different result, if we're going to expect something different from our partners, we need to hold them accountable to that. Um, but at the same time, we have to support them to get there. So we need to give them an environment to deliver healthcare differently. We need to give them an environment to try things differently. We need to encourage them to advertise differently. Um, and so those are the things that we're working with them on. Um, but at the end of the day, they're going to be held accountable, just like I would hold anybody else accountable, and they're going to be expected to deliver results. How long do you think it'll take the department to be fully compliant, or fully compliant, excuse me, with the injunction? I can't give you a timeline. Um, the only thing I can tell you is that we're working every single day as hard as we can to be compliant and to achieve compliance. I think that certain areas are um, much farther along in compliance than others, as I've mentioned some of those already, um, but we know there's work to do in other areas. Um, I can tell you that it's a priority, a top priority, um, and it's a priority for Governor Hobbs and her administration. Um, it's part of her roadmap forward for the state. Um, and so it's going to remain that top priority. I can't tell you, I'd love to be able to tell you that in 30, 60, 90 days we'll be fully compliant. Um, I, can't tell, I can't guarantee that for you today. The only thing I can guarantee is that me, my team, our partners are going to work as hard as we can to achieve compliance as quickly as we can. And, you know, the judge's order that came out Thursday before Friday, something, a lot of things stood out to us, but at one point it was written that she felt the department you know, had a complete failure to even make or even begin the systemic changes that are needed. How do you respond to that? Um, I respond to it just like I think you probably heard in court on Friday, not just from me, but from all the other parties in the courtroom. Um, number one, the order that was issued on Thursday had to do with a court monitoring report that was using data from September and even prior to September um, to draw some of those conclusions. Um, when you look at and when you hear the work that we're doing today in March, um, when you hear from the court monitors like they spoke on, on Friday, the progress is there. Uh, the progress is being made. We've implemented new treatment approaches. We've partnered with new off-site specialists in the community. We've coordinated transports differently. Um, hiring progress has been made on the custody side. Um, hiring progress is being made on the healthcare side. Um, there's things that are happening um, so to say that it's a failure or progress is lacking, um, I think, is outdated information. I think uh, what you heard in the courtroom, what people see in our metrics, what people hear from our population as a whole, is that progress is being made. But I do want to get into something that was brought up in court and something we've seen recently in death notifications is that there seems to be more suicides occurring, or at least recently there have been some. Are the prevention measures working if this is something that keeps happening? Yeah, so uh, I mean, first I just want to say the suicides, the, the, any suicide is a terrible tragedy. The stretch of suicides we've had is, is certainly unprecedented. Um, and I hate to see any single loss of life. Um, and you know, I, I, I wish people could see the countless numbers of hours and emotions and challenges and burdens that go into responding to each one of those specific instances. Um, what I'll tell you is every one of those, we've, we've had eight in the last 120 days. Um, and every single one of those has its own unique factors, dynamics, struggles, um, lengths of time incarcerated, you know, internal, external factors, all of that. Um, we are doing everything we can in response to that. I think, for me, part of the strategy that, that we're pushing extremely hard is, um, I'll say two things. One is, we need to do a much better job as a system to destigmatize mental illness um, amongst everybody, whether it's the uh, incarcerated population, staff, community, what have you. We need to make it a much better environment, a much more accessible environment to come forward ask for help, um, seek those services, and then be okay working through whatever those services are that we need. Um, I think 
many people will collectively agree that mental illness is still very stigmatized and it's no different in a correctional environment that makes it challenging sometimes for people to come forward and ask for help. So one of our significant pushes right now is to destigmatize that and to really give staff and the population the tools um, to, to really work through that. And, and really the second thing is improving how we engage with the population. Um, you know, it, I've talked since I, I came in last January that, you know, corrections historically has been about punishment, control, and really this lockdown sort of attitude. That doesn't work. It doesn't work to achieve the outcomes we want. And, you know, what we see is when you engage with somebody, when you effectively communicate, when you build some type of rapport and have some respectful, you know, dialogue back and forth, you can really bring down the struggles the tension you can you can find out more about what people are going through um, and so those are two of the things that we're pushing very hard on it's not going to solve every issue uh, but it builds a foundation that we can then launch new strategies from and so we're working through staff training um, efforts we're working through all of those different sort of strategies to improve um, how we do things and I think collectively it will address what we've seen over the last 120 days and my hope is, as it always is, is that we won't have any more going forward. Do you think the department should be responsible if someone takes their own life in prison? I think that the department is responsible for that. And, and there's a whole host of different ways that we're responsible. And we conduct a very thorough investigation in every one of those. And like I said, every one of them has different factors. Um, and we figure out to the extent we can what those factors are. And then there's accountability, responsibility based upon all of that. And we're actively doing that in every one of these cases. Um, and there will certainly be responsibility for those situations. And if I can quickly, I know we're over time now, but I do want to address homelessness briefly because I've covered a lot of that over the past couple of years here. And something we hear from providers is that a lot of times people who maybe wind up on the streets or come to the shelters are directly coming from prison. Is that what reentry is supposed to be like? That's absolutely not what we want reentry to be. Um, I think what you're seeing right now is a completely different approach and a shift in how we view reentry, but also how we view homelessness. Um, again, it's a strategy of Governor Hobbs uh, and, and a priority of hers um, and her administration. And it goes hand in hand with her priority for us to improve reentry services and bring down recidivism and, and all of the things that come with homelessness. Uh, what we are doing, what we've been doing over the last year is building better relationships with the community resources that are available. Um, the shelter resources that are available, and really how we have those handoffs made. Um, so if, if you've noticed, maybe um, we've had three uh, reentry and housing fairs that our community corrections teams put on in the community, um, and they've been wildly successful in terms of hundreds of vendors and partners coming, and it's a direct pipeline to that population in the community. And then we've extended that into our complexes where we have um, built partnerships um, using software, using relationships with Access Next Door and other, other people in the community to provide our case management staff in the facilities with direct pipelines, referral resources, so that when somebody's preparing for release, maybe 180 days out from release, they can start asking questions about where can I go if I don't have family to go to or a house to go to or a placement? what's available for me because at the end of the day I don't want to release anybody into the community homeless. Um, I understand it's going to be dependent on what's available but we have to do everything we can to make sure we provide those resources in advance um, and so I think you'll continue to see improvements in those areas. We have a long ways to go you know it, it's been a year to tackle some of these challenging issues that you bring up that you know some agencies don't challenge over, don't have to deal with over 20 30 year stretches um, but I think when you look back over the last year on things like reentry and some of these other topics we've talked about, we've made considerable progress. And I think people can expect and should expect that that's what we're going to continue to do going forward. We have been asking for several months to do a follow-up interview. And I appreciate that we've been able to do this today and try to get in as many questions as we can. But why did you decide to sit down with us now? 
I think it's just important to continue to share updates and information. Um, and I know, you know, your interests around the department are varied, right? Um, so it might have been air conditioning and the heat issues of last summer, but you also cover reporting on the injunction and everything in between. And so I think it's just important at times to sit down and, and give updates like this and have this kind of conversation. Do you have a timeline on when the HVAC will be upgraded at Perryville? It's in process right now. Uh, if you drive by, um, you can see ventilation going up on the external walls. You can see ventilation going into individual cells. Uh, so it's actively happening right now, which is far ahead of the timeline that we had last year. Um, and so I, I'm hopeful. I know we're going to have air conditioning in cells this summer that didn't have it last year. Um, I don't have a, a completion date for the entire project, but progress is being made, and, and I'm very pleased with how we've been able to adapt to a different plan than we had last summer.